I am going to talk about so-called plan giving. Are people familiar, besides our previous speaker, with plan giving at all? A little bit? It's kind of an American phenomenon, so it may not be familiar to some of you who are not from uh, the US. But basically, it's a very important weapon, or weapons too strong, tool is a nicer word, uh, to raise money. And I'm going to be talking about two rather large, mature, uh, robust programs that are producing tens of millions of dollars a year for the charities I've worked for. Uh, but I hope you'll just listen, uh, take some lessons home, even if you're at a one-person shop, a one-site museum, it may be useful for you to think about these things, and there may be some connections you can make, even at the smallest organization. And I hope those of you who are associated with the university, I know um, Gamble House, for instance, is associated with the USC, that you're already hooked in with your university's development department and are landing these kinds of gifts. Uh, so without further ado, what is a planned gift? Uh, generally, a planned gift is one that is considered in the overall context of a donor's estate uh, in tax planning. Generally, also, the payment to the charity or the gift to the charity is deferred, and very often it comes only upon the donor's death. Uh, so we're not talking about outright gifts or even traditional campaign gifts. We're talking about deferred gifts. Typical forms there at the bottom include a bequest under a will or a living trust. Beneficiary designations of an account. Uh, insurance is a pretty common one that we see. Uh, life income gifts. Uh, those are very important, and we'll talk about them at some length in a minute. But those include a charitable gift annuity. And I realized, does everyone, anyone know what a charitable gift annuity is? Kind of. This is a simple contractual arrangement between a donor and the charity. The charity agrees to pay the donor an annuity, thus the name charitable gift annuity, for the donor's life or someone else's life. And then the charity receives whatever's left at the time the annuitant dies. So it's a very simple contractual arrangement. Uh, Pooled income fund is something a little bit different, but not dissimilar. A charitable remainder trust is a similar idea, just takes the form of a trust agreement, not a contract. So fairly complex sometimes, but those can be very important tools in the, uh, for a plan giving program. At the bottom there, there are other uh, irrevocable trust arrangements and some very tax motivated arrangements that also fall under the rubric of plan giving. Uh, those are going to be used by very sophisticated donors and usually pushed by their advisors, uh, not necessarily by you on the charitable side. And I, I hope people bequest is an understood legacy. That is by far the most important thing. If you do nothing else when you get home, uh, consider doing a, a communication to your base about the possibility of leaving a bequest to your organization. Motivations. Uh, why do people do these? Uh, some are tax motivated, uh, partly because in the United States uh, there is a federal estate tax and many states also have estate taxes. So taxes on whatever you own at the moment you die. Uh, in a sense, this is less and less important because of um, the changes in the rules recently. The limits have been raised to the point where a couple can now give away of something like $23 million uh, free of tax to anyone they want to. So very few people are worried about federal estate tax. Uh, and I'm so, we, there's a perfect introduction about the transactional versus the relational. But if a plan gift is tax motivated, I worry sometimes that it's really a transactional interaction, not a real gift. And that can be important because many of these gifts, the life income gifts in particular, uh, donors receive sizable income tax deductions. And if the gift is not charitable, uh, it's hard to prove that, but I don't take gifts from people we don't know at all, generally speaking, for fear that they may not be charitable. There's no charitable intent. Uh, hard to say no, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. Uh, and we talked about the taxes. The real motivation is, of course, uh, wanting to support your mission. And I'm so glad that Amanda mentioned this because mission, if you don't have a strong mission, you don't pitch the mission, you don't espouse the mission, you're not going to get a lot of gifts. So really people are wanting to support your organization. 
and in this case, they're supporting it with their legacy, effectively. Not just an annual gift, not even a major gift. It's a portion of their lifetime savings that they're giving to your organization. And in the US, this is not necessarily expected, but there is a very long tradition of this kind of giving, of giving in general, uh, because we don't have a strong federal arts program, to say the least, as you all know very well, who are US-based. Uh, and I always tell the Europeans that here the charitable sector generates more than 5% of the uh, U.S. gross income, uh, sorry, gross domestic product and employs something like 10% of the workforce. So the nonprofit sector in the U.S. is huge and this is part of how it, it's supported. Uh, and I, the bottom point there is even public charities like the New York Public Library where I worked uh, res that receive lots of government money still rely on private funds uh, to make the doors stay open and to pay people like me to raise more money. Uh, so it's really, really important, this kind of private fundraising, I would say especially in the US, but probably in all of your situations. A quick snapshot of the library's program. Uh, really, the origin of the library in the late 19th century was due to three planned gifts, uh, the Astor and Lennox libraries and some funds and uh, Samuel Tilden's bequest. He specifically uh, gave his money for a public reading room. They combined the two private libraries and really created a huge institution out of those three gifts. Uh, Tilden's a good example of a planned gift person. He was a single gentleman without children. And single and childless is where you want to be in this area. <laughs> and I always say, uh, old is good, but dead is better. <laughs> uh, but really you're going to want to focus, we'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, single females tend to be the dominant group you're going to look at for playing gifts. Uh, they are more charitable than the men. Very often they will uh, have, if they ha were married and didn't have kids, they'll be the one to survive, the last to die. So that's where the money is. And Tilden's a good early example of that for us. Uh, many other bequests were received by the library uh, in the first 90 years of its existence, but the dedicated plan giving program only started in the 1980s. And since that time, it has been consistently staffed with two or three to four professionals with defined responsibilities. This is a luxury that probably almost no one in the room will have, uh, but it's critical to having a robust program is having dedicated staffing, even if it's part time of someone's job to look at this area. Uh, we launched life income programs in the early 90s, and there's a handout in that little wad of stuff I gave you showing the book of the library's expectancies as of last summer. This is a great tool, uh, both to prove to my boss, former boss, and the board that the program was valuable to them. Uh, what it doesn't show is that more than half of the gifts the library received on average came in from people we did not know about beforehand, who had not told us we were in their estate plan. So I conservatively estimate here at the top that's double the amount that I calculated on this sheet. You can look at this at your leisure, but I think it's a useful tool if you start to develop a program to show uh, the scope and the return on investment. Um, the MET program is not dissimilar. Uh, lots of big plan gifts, uh, especially of art, surprise, surprise, at an art museum, but also of money. And if you go to the Metropolitan uh, when you're here this week, um, and look at the labels carefully, you will see the name Rogers and Fletcher after a lot of the purchased gifts. Those were two early 20th century bequests, of multi-million dollar bequests that have really done wonders for the museum. So very, very important that there was money early on. Uh, again, many other bequests for a couple hundred, about a hundred years, but the plan giving program at the museum started only in the late 1970s, and it has been consistently staffed since that time. Uh, smaller numbers uh, and a slightly different program uh, but consistently staffed. Life income gifts again in the early 1990s. And I don't have a similar analysis as of the uh, expectancies, uh, but there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars out there waiting to come to the Met and lots of equally valuable art. So big pools and it's really important. Bequests are king. Um, as I said, life income gifts are great. Certain donors love them. Uh, I look at them as loss leaders, uh, getting people in the door and keeping, starting to cultivate them and steward them. Uh, but what you really want to focus on are bequests. 
And when I say bequests, I really do mean to include beneficiary designations and payable on death accounts, because those can be quite uh, valuable as well. Uh, as I said, that, or ha hinted at, the trusts and life income gifts uh, bring several forms of liability, at least some of which you will bear the brunt of. If you are issuing annuities and your donor lives to be 104, uh, guess what? You're not going to get anything out of that annuity. That's part of the cost of doing business, but the longevity risk is assumed by both parties, but very often the charity will be on the wrong end. Also, the financial investment risk is going to be on you if you are guaranteeing payments to a donor. Uh, and if any of those things go wrong, um, it really can end up being reputational damage, which is the most uh, serious of all. We've had, at both institutions, alas, uh, lead trusts that kind of exploded. And we won't talk about lead trusts too much because they're very complex and very rare. But that's where the charity receives the money up front in the form of payments, and then the funds revert back to the donor's family, usually. Uh, sometimes they don't work out very well. The donor is not happy. The trust, uh, charities aren't happy. The advisors are fired or worse. Uh, but in the end, it's soured a relationship between a donor and the charity for no particular reason. I think it was an inept lawyer, frankly. And I'm a lawyer, so I can say that. Prospecting. Um, I'm so glad I followed Amanda because she covered a lot of this as well. Um, from my viewpoint, if your organization has a well-managed database of at least several thousand names, let's just say a thousand, because I know that several thousand may sound like a lot, you may have a reasonable plan giving pool especially if your supporters are skewed older demographically. Um, I'd say like the age of this room is pretty good pool of people. Not to <laughs> make any names or imply anything. But again, old is good, dead is better. Uh, mix of direct email, direct mail, excuse me, and e-communications or combination can be effective. Uh, and th these are appeals are quite different from annual fund or membership appeals and major gifts appeals. These are kind of an ongoing drip. You want to just keep messaging to people that you can do this for the library, you can do this for the museum, you can do this for the, the house. And it could just be a simple uh, drop in your newsletter. Um, in fact, on the back of this number sheet, I think I gave you uh, an example from the library. This was in the print newsletter that went out to like 60,000 people. And it's again, people, people give to people. I don't like that expression, but it's a face so that someone can identify with this. It is a single childless female, which isn't clear, but that's generally the, the idea. And this is a lady who uses the library so much she's giving it her entire estate. Uh, but a very simple thing, we have dedicated real estate in all donor communications, both places I've worked, and it's just the way to go. Um, and if you're just starting out, I think a testimonial letter, a standalone testimonial can be very effective or a testimonial in the form of a, a column in a newsletter. Uh, that can be very good. And if you, especially if you have a founder or a well-regarded volunteer leader, they may be the person to provide the testimonial. It may be someone sitting in this room. I think Natasha would be a good example. Uh, but that's a way to start this, process, this uh, way of exploring this area. If your database is large enough, and I was fortunate in both places I've worked in recent years to have uh, tens of thousands of names, hundreds of thousands actually, uh, segment. So you're targeting the right demographic. And again, the factors that are most important are age uh, for plan giving, years of consistent giving at any level, and recent giving. Uh, age goes without saying. These are usually going to come at death, so you don't want to be prospecting 30-year-olds, although it's important that they hear the message. Uh, years of consistent giving is probably the most important factor, uh, or it's, I weight it very highly, because uh, age is sometimes very hard to get, good age data, unless you're at a university, say, or a school. Uh, but years of consistent giving, even if they're giving you $10 a year, if they've given you $10 a year for 30 years consistently, that's gold. Uh, a, 30 years means that they're pretty old already. Uh, the consistency means they're extremely loyal and are engaged, and that's who you should be targeting. And recent giving, I think it's important only to, so we know the person is still with us, and then there is a, a pattern right at the end of life that's very important, they stop giving, and usually then three to five years later, you'll get the notice of probate and the bequest. 
So it's little idiosyncrasies if you look at a lot of this data. Secondary factors there in the middle of the slide. Uh, familial status and gender are extremely important, and I already said it, but single, older, childless women are your key demographic. And the size of gifts can give you a hint of capacity. Uh, I call it kind of a unicorn thing, but very often we'll have that $20, uh, actually it's $70 at the museum and it was $40 at the library. Donor, but then they'll make one or two $5,000 gifts. Those ladies have money. Uh, they're just not giving it to you now. And sure enough, there are six and seven figure bequests at the end of the day because they are so careful. But those little spike gifts can show some capacity. And I did one mailing modeling that and we did very, very well. Uh, identifying some of those, I'll, I'll call them unicorns, but uh, needles in a haystack, whatever you want to say. Uh, current plan giving donors are probably your best prospects and potential ambassadors for your program. Uh, especially life income donors, if they like the life income gifts, they will do them every year, year in, year out. Uh, we have one at the museum that has 25 annuities, and the library had a gal who had 18, not uncommon. So they are really get into it. Uh, direct mail vendors in the US are uh, one way people do this. I don't like them because they're both costly and once you've seen one of those things from say your alma mater and then you get it from this another charity just lightly rebranded, I think it may not help your efforts very much. Uh, at the library uh, we sent about 30,000 letters annually, print testimonials, and I provided you a copy of a print testimonial in that packet. Um, this is this gentleman looking rather dour. Um, he's dead, which is part of the reason he looks so dour. <laughs> um, it's a great story. This one was always effective. We ran it every couple years because uh, it really resonated with a lot of people. Great story. A little too long, frankly, because a lot of people will not turn this one over, uh, but he got very good results. We alternated between living and dead donors in these stories, and sometimes people responded better to one or the other, so I th think the alternation was important. Um, and we used to send out two, three, four times a year up to like 60,000 people, uh, these kinds of letters. Uh, more recently, we numbered, numbered, number was lowered, that's what I'm reading, and we really segmented much more carefully. And for that purpose, I used an algorithm, and I handed that out to you as well. Um, don't take the time to read this now, but these are the numbers, the sheet with the numbers on it, uh, as a way of trying to dig in and find the right people. And this is a very crude one, but it was very, very effective at getting the numbers down. And sure enough, it produced a perfect pyramid of donors with a huge wide base, and then the upper deciles were the people we sent the mail to, or tried to at least send once a year to. So that was an effective way. And you'll see that years giving was probably the most important weighted figure. Uh, along with number of gifts. And so people who do um, multiple gifts in a year and for many years, those are the people you want to target for plan giving efforts. Um, and then I think I also gave you our brochure there, the kind of an aqua colored thing. In recent years at the library, we printed a brochure, which I had resisted for years, but we did the content for it ourselves. It's uh, meant to be a folding brochure. I don't have access to them anymore, so I had to do a PDF. Uh, we mailed that to a, a slightly larger group, and that was very, very successful. Uh, I was a little surprised, but it was a good experiment. And it, has a, it had a self-mailer aspect to it, and it worked extremely well. At the library, the older testimonials regularly yielded up to 100 qualified responses, and we heard a little bit about qualified. In my terminology, qualified means they weren't just um, checking every box and just sending it because that's what they do to everything they receive in the mail, but people with a genuine interest, and between 20 and 40 new commitments for each mailing we did. Remember, we sent these out to 15, 20, 30,000 people, and if, you, if I yielded 40 new members, I was thrilled because each of those people, on average, is going to um, send in, or their estate will uh, send in upwards of $80,000 to the library. So it's a valuable thing. When you get a new commitment, it actually has a value. Smaller mailings in recent years yielded similar results proportionally, uh, but slightly more new commitments. So we, fewer new commitments, but more for per piece of mail sent out. And the brochure mailing, as I said, did well. And having a brochure is not a bad thing to hand out at events like this. And so I think it's not a bad thing to consider 
if you get into the plan giving thing in a serious way. And probably most importantly there at the bottom, uh, be willing to try new things, evaluate your, your mailing. I know it's tedious, but it's really a good exercise to evaluate it annually and mix things up and update the materials as tax and their laws change. And again, never lose sight of your mission. I early on did one mailing that was all about taxes and it was a good lesson because I got screeds from these library supporters about taxes because they said it's not about taxes and they were right. Uh, at that time it was a sensitive time for taxes but uh, it's really about your mission not about tax avoidance or the death tax or anything like that and do, do not use those terms. Uh, prospecting at the Met is slightly different. I did give you this uh, newsletter. This is sent to about 5,000 higher level donors. At the Met that means uh, $1,500 or more. And we always get the centerfold for the Met's Williams Society. That's our legacy society. And we always feature at least one donor story, maybe an event with some pictures. This one has an embarrassing little thing about me because I was brand new when this came out last fall. Uh, this is fun to read it when you're later on today you can see with the kinds of giving that's going on at the Met. And very nicely, uh, the Irvings here have just given us $80 million through Mr. Irving's trust. He, he's dead. She's almost dead, but anyway. Uh, so we had a very good year for my first year. And the other thing that we're always nice to have is that there's always a bequest on this recent gifts. And I think, again, just this, even if someone just sees that, they'll know that you can make a legacy to the museum. So just constantly communicating that it's possible. We also do traditional targeted mailings. Uh, and when I say mailings, I mean direct mail, physical mailing, uh, about 35,000. We put in a little slip in annual appeals, uh, both to advertise planning seminars, as well as to encourage people to self-identify bequests. That's critical if you're sending out lots of mail, allow people to check a box saying that I have included the house in my estate plans because those people are going to people will start to do it if you consistently message that way um, our life income mailing and i have um, copies in the back if you want to get it or during the break i didn't have enough to share this is a self mailer um, that is designed to get interest in life income gifts uh, if this one doesn't do so well but then we sent one like this out five years ago at the museum and someone just returned it last week. So people do sit on this stuff, and when they're ready, they'll return it. So it's very important to have stuff out. Um, I'm gonna try and change things up since I will be there a year uh, in September, and I'll, I'm gonna try a traditional standalone testimonial because the museum has not done one in some years. And I put house style issues, but that's insider stuff. <laughs> Other ways to prospect, the website can be very important. Uh, I tend to find that People look at that just to get the quick information, especially lawyers that are working with donors. Make sure it's on there so that they get it. Uh, but what you really want to do is have them contact you and start a relationship or a dialogue. So I purposely at the library kept things off the website so that people had to call us and get the information. And so they, we knew who they were and we could start a conversation. Um, that's the second point there. There are uh, some fancy prospecting tools. Those come and go, and I think that they may be useful if you're a one-man shop and really want to try this in a concentrated way. Uh, but again, I think the personal relationship building is really the most important thing, and those I don't think do that as well as just a traditional program. And there are lots of fancy uh, vendor-generated websites. Like the newsletters, I find these a little bit generic. Uh, they all look kind of the same. They all have great calculators so you can find out how much of an annuity you could get, right? Uh, but very often, I think, again, people uh, look at those, do the little calculator, never contact you. So I think sometimes leaving information out may not be a bad thing so that people contact you instead of getting it all on the website. Estate and gift planning seminars. I used to present, um, well, at least 10 a year when I was at the library and at the museum, uh, an annual outside excuse me, an outside expert does one annually. These are basically educational, but they also can really help identify prospects and qualify leads. If a person comes to the seminars three times running and asks a lot of questions and checks a box saying that they're interested in possibly doing something for the library slash museum, they're a pretty good lead 
And I think in many cases they convert without even telling us. And sure enough, five years later, we'll get a bequest from someone who had been kind of a seminar groupie. Uh, I wouldn't do those if you're a small shop and don't really have a history of doing that kind of thing. But if you're part of a big organization, make sure that your donors are invited to those kinds of things if the larger organization is doing them. Stewardship. Um, I spend way too much time on this because I love it. Uh, it's really fun and it's, it's really the, what you do after you've gotten someone in house. Uh, they say you're in our plans. Uh, then you steward them till death, literally. <laughs> Uh, it's legacy society or equivalents, very important. At the library, we had one called the Bigelow Society with about 1,000 members. And at the museum, there's one called the Met Williams Society, which has 800 members. And again, this is probably roughly half of the actual people out there who have bequest intentions, uh, self-identify while they're alive. There are many more people out there who have intentions. Uh, at the library, we had 10 annual events, which was probably too many. Uh, including a formal tea in the spring that the ladies loved, which I hated, uh, <laughs> and actually uh, attracted a good portion of the group, uh, upwards of 300 people. Uh, it was on our premises, so we didn't have rental fees, but it still cost $30,000. So be careful if you establish a pattern of really nice events for these people. They will expect them. Uh, and that was one thing I was happy to give up when I went uptown. Uh, the Met offers fewer events. In fact, I think we offer too few but they're very, very, very uh, elegant. Uh, I think they're too elegant too, so it's kind of a weird mix. Um, so we're gonna mix things up. Birthday and holiday cards are a no-brainer. I hope some of you already send out cards to supporters, no? If you know their birthday, you will know it if they're a life income donor, uh, send them a birthday card. It's a no-brainer, they will renew a gift. Um, some people know that to do on their actuarial birthday, is when they get the next higher uh, annuity rate. And I sign a biannual letter listing all of our upcoming events and personalizing each one. It takes about two days, but it's really valuable. And that's one simple touch that people actually come in brandishing them and say, oh, it's so lovely to get something personal. Uh, it seems like a, a no brainer to me if you have the time. Uh, and members are always listed in the annual report unless they prefer to remain anonymous. Uh, and a lot of people like that as well. If they want to be anonymous, make sure that their name does not get out there. Backend is important. Estate administration, it's great if you're named in the plan, but if you don't uh, have a good estate administration set up, you're not going to get the funds in a timely manner. Uh, I was a trust and estates attorney before going into nonprofit, uh, and I knew a lot about the process, and I enjoyed this part of the work, uh, but it's very, very important. Hopefully, if you're at a big organization, you have a business office that can help you. Uh, beware, though, that business offices don't like problematic estates. Um, if you have a general counsel or some outside legal help, they may be very helpful in this context. Uh, if you do life income gifts, um, use an outside vendor uh, if you get a big program going, because you do not want to be doing state filings, tax returns, uh, tax filings at all. Uh, and if you do have a good finance department, and this is again, is presuming a large organization, uh, even if they're good, they're not gonna wanna have that hassle either, in my experience. And being timely is very, very important, especially in estates, can take years to mature, or for the distributions to be made. And so we had a, a tickler system, three months, six months, nine months, depending on the situation. And uh, hopefully you're a residuary beneficiary, so you're getting a share of the overall leftover estate. That can take years, but that's where the big money is, generally speaking. And in New York, we have a charities bureau that can help, and we also have a professional advisory council at the museum, and I can ask those members for help in particular situations that are tricky. How to use the money is not uh, something we should uh, let uh, just happen. Uh, since you generally cannot predict when someone's going to die or when the estate will distribute, again, it can take years after someone dies for the executor to finally write that check to you. It makes little sense to have an annual budget goal for realized bequest dollars. Although uh, when I started at the library, I had to raise $5 million a year unrestricted to fill that part of the budget that was going to be $5 million spent already by the time I was filling up that hole. Uh, it never was a problem, 
And I should say that at both the library and the museum, we raise on average about 15 to $20 million on a rolling basis, excluding multi, uh, bigger gifts, like the Irving's gift. So the consistent flow of 15 million that they could count on, some restricted, but largely unrestricted, and then large bequests on top of those that were kind of more transformative uh, for particular areas. Uh, the library now has a really good uh, policy, which I, if you have a, hopefully have this problem of receiving bequests, uh, all unrestricted bequests become board designated endowment or funds functioning as endowment. Uh, the board can then recharacterize those funds at any time in the future to use them for operating purposes or a capital project. Uh, but basically they're kept as a rainy day fund for now. And uh, at the library, after we implemented this policy, we raised so much more than $100 million in quasi endowment that it threw off the $5 million a year that my, was my former goal. Uh, so it was a very elegant uh, policy. Uh, the Met has a really strange policy, which I'm going to work on changing, but only gifts over $100,000 unrestricted become board designated endowment. Does everyone understand what I'm talking about? Board designated versus donor designated. Donor designated, you cannot dip into. That is do, uh, endowment. Board designated, they can change their mind about how to use the money. So a really good way of doing this if you get a, a good program going. Great. Other back-end considerations, um, donor restrictions, and we talked about this. I think there was a question about this as well. Uh, generally happy to honor those so long as they are reasonably cons consistent with the mission and operations, uh, obviously. Hopefully it's a conversation you can have with the donor while they're still alive. And so you don't get a bequest, uh, notice of probate, a will that has something that you cannot fulfill or is totally uh, not part of your mission. If that does happen, you can go to court, but that's gonna cost a lot, it's gonna take a long time, and it's not a place you wanna be. And generally, at the library and the museum, unless it was a huge amount of money, we would just uh, disclaim if it was something we couldn't do appropriately or easily. Up to like, I'd say I disclaimed a $2 million estate because it just wasn't something we wanted to have to deal with. Recognition. Uh, None other than listing an annual report unless the gift instrument requires naming, et cetera. This is something you'll negotiate, hopefully, with the donor and their advisors while they're alive. Um, and the naming of funds is a, one thing, but physical naming is very fraught. Uh, I know of no mainline charity, at least in New York, that will do it for more than, say, 50 years, except my former, um, the Stephen A. Schwarzman building is one that got negotiated uh, for perpetuity, whatever that means. But uh, be very cognizant that things can change and put a time limit on naming opportunities. Surviving family there at the bottom, uh, we always handled those ad hoc, uh, but be very sensitive, especially to surviving spouses. Um, obviously, I think you would be generally, but do un uh, stand up to unhappy children, uh, especially if the loved one's intentions are clear. You better believe it that the kids who didn't get anything when the library or the museum got a couple million dollars knocked on our door. And uh, unless there was some compelling evidence that they, something was fishy, we would just say, we'll look at the four corners of the document and you effectively were disinherited and we'll just let, make them go away. They have the right to sue, some do, uh, but generally if you make a firm uh, stand up to them, they will go away. Good problem to have, I guess, to have a money in, in and someone worrying about it. Final thoughts. Uh, plan giving works best if your donor, donor database is reasonably large and well managed. And if plan giving is an adequately funded part of development efforts, ideally with dedicated staff, at least part if not full time. I know that's probably wildly unrealistic for most of the people in the room, but it may be something to aspire to. Uh, board and senior management must buy in or you will set yourself up to struggle or fail. This is a long-term investment, people. Uh, the people I'm getting on board right now, very likely their gifts won't mature till after I'm long retired. Uh, and I was just at the library long enough, 14 years, to see people come in, die, and then to receive the funds. But it's that kind of a cycle, 15 to 20 year cycle, in my experience. Uh, you can do a return on investment analysis on individual marketing efforts. But again, this is a sustained institutional investment if you wanna have a successful program. Maybe you're not there yet, 
Maybe you need to team up with a community foundation in your area or something like that, but it really should be a sustained investment, not just something you try from time to time. Focus on bequests and beneficiary designations, and especially uh, if you're starting out, secure those from your board and other influencers uh, who may provide testimonials. So very important to get board buy-in uh, both institutionally and personally. And that's something that we always struggled with at these big New York charities. Uh, think twice, I say no three times, before offering life income gifts or serving as a trustee. Uh, just don't do it. Do not do it unless you have a very, very large endowment and a very sophisticated finance and legal department. Uh, timely and consistent communication with prospects, advisors, committed donors, estate representatives, regulators, vendors, and peers is critical. And that's really what I do all day is manage relationships with all those different people. About 90% of my time is just relationships, 5% is technical, and then 5% is managing other people, uh, which is not always fun. Uh, so put simply, plan giving is all about creating and maintaining relationships with your core supporters and eventually with their estates. Uh, be professional but personal and never forget your organization's mission and your role. It is very easy to become friends with these people, especially in this context, um, especially with single older women who have no friends, it seems. <laughs> and I became too close with two or three and I just had to kind of push it back. And that was one of the better things about changing jobs is I, I shed one of them because she's not a, a supporter of the museum. But be very careful which hat you're wearing uh, and don't make it into a personal relationship. Or if you do, expect that it will become a personal relationship. So I thank you for your attention and wonder if you have any questions or thoughts. Yes. Yeah, so generally about naming opportunities, yeah, time limits. Yeah, yeah, we, um, it's a newer thing, and uh, please chime in, Amanda, if you have thoughts. It's a newer thing, but uh, I think the days of in perpetuity naming are gone, even for the largest gifts, with, again, some exceptions. Um, Mr. Schwarzman drove a very hard bargain at the library, gave $100 million, and his name is in six places on the library in uh, negotiated height type. And that was I think it was. He's done the same thing at our alma mater up the road here in New Haven. He gave 150 million there and he wants the Schwarzman Center. So whatever Napoleon complex, who knows, but he wants his name. Um, otherwise, I think 50 years is a pretty common standard. And depending on the size of your charity budget and what you want done, that's not unreasonable. And even if it stays on perpetually, uh, after you're gone, someone may not even know it's time limited. But the thought is that that does allow it to be re resold, partly. And also, generally, I think at that point in time, no one who knew the person is going to be around, which sounds a little heartless, but I think that's often the case. Even if they have grandchildren, they're not going to, yeah. The very famous example in recent years is Avery Fisher Hall, which is now Geffen Hall at the Lincoln Center. Um, Avery Fisher had one of the traditional forever things, and they ended up having to pay the Fisher family back, or they gave money back to the Fisher family when they renamed it David Geffen Hall, because he made a larger gift. So that's the kind of situation you want to avoid. And um, generally, uh, we have a pretty good track record um, of people with bequests don't generally involve naming. And, and usually, if anything, we do it gratuitously in honor of the gift if it's something really transformative. You can read that about the Irvings. Um, this couple here on the inside, they have given tens of millions of dollars before to the Met, and half the galleries in the Asian department are named after them, part of the library is named after them. But those were, in most cases, uh, subject to traditional gift agreements and with time limits. Yes.
something else you want them to do? Or? So someone trying to uh, attract these kinds of gifts to the outside? Yeah. Um, ideally, two things. I want them, the person that's doing the presentation, to uh, be identifiable to the audience. It may be not necessarily in terms of age, but it's a personal, like starting to create a relationship. And then to the extent that they can do that, the person can, uh, I'm thinking more of a testimonial situation, but it's identifying yourself and the person providing the testimonial. If it's just a presentation about your charity to prospects, I think it's just all about the mission. Entirely mission, mission, mission. And just making sure that it's, yeah, compelling. I'm not sure I'm answering your question correctly, but yeah, it's tricky. And I'd say in all this rubric, unless you have a, a membership program in place, it's going to be extremely hard to make plan giving stick without that framework. Because I, I spend all my time fishing in our membership pool. And I say membership, but it can be any person who's made a financial gift who's in the database is going to get run through my um, algorithm, which we perfected at the museum, by the way, by getting rid of age entirely. Age is so hard because we have very bad records. And if you wait it too much, some people will pop up at the detriment of others. So we just made age a, an add-on instead of part of the original algorithm. I didn't answer your question at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> One more. Yeah. 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 And uh, the other big thing is to um, the point of these gifts is that they will allow the mission to continue for future generations. And if that's not part of the message, um, then you're missing something or you're not addressing the legacy aspect of it. So pe do you want future generations to see the house the way you did, enjoy the house as you have? Uh, it's lasted already 100 years, shouldn't it? I guess most of you are modern. 50 years, um, let's make it last another 50 years. And uh, that's one other idea on uh, marketing. If you have an important date, uh, anniversary date, 50 is a big one, 100 is even better. Uh, you can make a legacy campaign based on the anniversary. That kind of an anniversary is a great time to launch this kind of an effort. Even a single standalone appeal if you want to try the waters, that might be a good time to tie it into an anniversary of that sort. I had a question over there. Yeah. The questions were about wealth screening, which is usually provided by a third party vendor. Um, oh, what are the ones here? Wealth Engine and. Yeah, wealth engine is the one that used to come yeah. Yeah. And what they'll do, these third party vendors, for a fee, mind you, <laughs> usually either per record fee or a, they have different ways of billing you, uh, they'll look at your people and uh, attrib uh, do a ranges of estimated wealth some demographic information sometimes, which I have found very variable in terms of quality. Uh, but it can help to determine capacity, and that can be one way of segmenting in, uh, along the ways I was discussing. I had, uh, again, with a large database, we had enough data in our database to do our own screening through that, that rather crude algorithm, I think is as effective as wealth screening. And again, I think the wealth management or wealth screening sometimes misses those $40 donors who end up giving you a quarter of their estate, which is worth $300,000, they're not gonna rank very highly in a wealth screening necessarily, uh, especially if their major source of their wealth is a teacher's pension, which is not uncommon in our situation. We're not a pension, but a retirement plan, excuse me. And, uh, and an apartment that they've lived in for 40 years, which is now worth a million dollars. Uh, they end up being incredibly affluent, but not in the traditional uh, way that those things generally capture. The real estate they will capture uh, I guess I'm trying to say I don't think they're really worth it unless you have a director who's willing to shell out the money 
and they'll, if they're going to do it, by all means, take advantage of doing it. Uh, but I'm not sure that they're the be all and end all. Uh, they are good if you don't have a research department. I'm guessing not many people have a prospect research department. Um, I was fortunate to have teams helping me on that side too. And I figured in a sense it's their job, not an outside vendor to do that kind of screening. The other question was about when and how do you use talent? A curator, uh, the founding director, or whatever. Uh, we always have curators uh, address groups. It's just much more efficient and they have so many um, also the library, the librarians would address groups and we would not have them come in on a meeting unless it was a restricted gift to a particular area. And this is talking, this is a large institution, both cases, but if the gift was to Asian art, we wanted to have the head of the Asian art department at the table because he or she, depending on your case, would be the one who knows the departmental goals and mission and would be able to talk about those, not the gift officer. Uh, my ultimate goal is to get unrestricted gifts, and I think I can espouse the mission as well as any of the program people on staff. Uh, I'm getting there at the museum. I was great at the library. <laughs> it may be very different, especially if you're a small place and just starting out. You may have to have the vision person there at the table to get someone excited. But uh, in my experience, having them come in afterwards or to talk to groups on an ongoing basis is more efficient. I had two other things. This is the self-mailer, and I had this way overdone brochure that the museum had for many years with my, one of my favorite Egyptian pieces on it. The, I have some additional copies of these in the back if you want to come and grab them at the break. Very few of these, in a, but almost enough of these for everyone in the room. I just didn't think I had enough to tuck them in the packet. Any other questions? Thanks.